I'm very happy to be here. It is a great honor to receive the first SciLab Distinguished Alumni Award. I'd like to thank SciLab and the award committee for being so supportive. I'm also extremely excited to come back to CMU this year. I'll be be uh, beginning my 28th grade. I want to talk about a really simple consensus protocol called Streamlit. This is joint work with my student, Benjamin Chen. Since the protocol is so simple and I can really cover it in three minutes, I'm going to mix it up with some storytelling to make it more fun. Let me first explain what a blockchain protocol is. Uh, of course, as we know, blockchain is the new modern name. Uh, classically, we call them state machine replication or consensus. And for the rest of the talk, all these terms pretty much mean the same thing. In this example, we have a set of Ethereum nodes and they're trying to agree on the linearly ordered log of transactions. There are two important security properties that we care about, namely consistency and liveness. Consistency says that all of the honest players must agree on the log. Uh, so it could be your network is a little faster than mine and your log grows a little faster, that's okay. But it must be that you know, my log is a prefix of yours or yours of mine. Liveness says that whenever I buy coffee, I want my transaction to appear in all of the honest players' logs fairly quickly. It's not like I wanna wait forever for my coffee, so now if all the players are honest and they correctly follow the protocol, then the problem is kind of trivial. But what makes it a technically challenging problem is when some of these players can be malicious or corrupt, and these corrupt players can deviate arbitrarily from the prescribed protocol. And even under such adversarial circumstances, we want to make sure that the remaining set of honest players must nonetheless satisfy these two security properties. So I got interested in consensus because of decentralized cryptocurrencies, but actually consensus has been around and has been studied for more than three decades. In fact, for more than a decade, companies in the Silicon Valley have deployed consensus to have redundancy and replication in their computing infrastructure. Well, cryptocurrencies, of course, took consensus to the next new level because as we know, you know, excitingly, Bitcoin showed for the first time that consensus is actually possible on the internet scale. And not only so, in a completely open permission um, environment, right? This is also called the permissionless environment. Okay, decentralized permissionless consensus started with uh, Bitcoin's proof of work, which was in fact a breakthrough idea that helped us overcome uh, the so-called Sybil attack. But because of the enormous energy waste uh, associated with proof of work, various blockchain projects have started switching to a new paradigm called proof of stake. In proof of work, your voting power is proportional to your hash power, whereas in proof of stake, you have voting power proportional to the amount of cryptocurrencies you hold in the system. Interestingly, Proof of stake protocols actually return to our classical roots of permission consensus. At any snapshot of time, the consensus committee is well defined and their public keys are well known. In proof of stake, we need to periodically uh, reconfigure and rotate the consensus committee to reflect this, the latest uh, state, state distribution. Now, this is great news, right? Because we can now essentially leverage the past three decades of work on distributed consensus. But strangely enough, apparently every blockchain company felt like they had to reinvent their own consensus protocol. And you might ask why. It turns out that somewhat surprisingly, although you know there's been three decades of work in this area, the classical style consensus protocols are still somewhat complex and difficult to understand. And I'm talking about, you know, protocols like PPFT, Paxos, and their numerous variants. And this is like despite years of work in making them simpler, including well-known works such as, you know, Paxos Made Simple, the ABCDs of Paxos, Raft, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. So this consensus inherently have to be so complicated. In this talk, I'm going to tell you a new consensus protocol called Streamlit, 
that is almost absurdly simple. It is also very natural um, in the sense that, you know, the most natural way to understand it is the correct way. So we think it can be a unified protocol for both teaching and implementation. And in case it's not clear enough, Streamlit essentially subsumes the classical candidates such as PBFT and Paxos. Before I jump into technical details, I want to quickly mention at a very high level, there are two classes of approaches for constructing a, a blockchain protocol, right? The, the first type of approach is through sequential composition of single shot consensus, often called Byzantine agreement. Okay, but this approach is like more theoretical. It's like seldom adopted in practice. Um, and to the best of our knowledge, almost all practically deployed uh, consensus protocols adopt a direct blockchain construction approach. Uh, and because, you know, this direct uh, construction approach uh, allows us to perform uh, system level pipelining and optimizations more easily, like had it been this compositional approach, it's like quite difficult to perform across instance optimizations. So we are going to stick to the second approach, uh, direct blockchain construction throughout this talk. Before I tell you about Streamlit, I'm going to quickly tell you how classical protocols work. I mean, although these protocols are known to be complex, there is actually a part of these protocols that's really simple, natural, elegant, and this is the part we want to keep, but only this part. Okay, and before I begin, uh, I'll quickly mention the blockchain's format, right? So the, we are going to assume that all the blocks are chained together through cryptographic hashes, right? It's a hash chain. Uh, essentially, every block starts the hash of the parent chain. And it also starts the epoch number, which is kind of like a timestamp, and then the set of transactions you want to confirm. So for the time being, we can just assume that the epoch numbers increment one by one in the valid blockchain. So here is a very natural voting-based protocol. Uh, and the guy in the middle, Vitalik, is uh, the leader uh, we also call him the proposer, and the other folks are voters. Some people may be corrupt, like in this case, Loki is corrupt. The leader may also be corrupt, by the way. So we are going to use a voting-based approach to agree on every block, right? We agree on one block every epoch, and essentially in every epoch, the leader first makes a proposal, right? He um, proposes the block, by signing it. In this case, he proposed the orange block. Next, everyone votes. A vote is a signature on the proposed block. If you are honest, you are going to vote on the first proposal you hear from the leader. In this case, if you are honest because the leader proposed an orange block, you would cast an orange vote. But remember, Loki is corrupt, so he didn't vote for the orange block. He voted for the two blue blocks instead, and he didn't even vote uniquely, right? So what do we do now? Uh, now we wait. We wait until we, uh, we receive uh, two thirds votes from distinct voters. And once that happens, you know, you're confident that many people have the same belief and therefore you can confirm or finalize the block. So this is a very natural idea. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to call a collection of two-thirds and votes, a notarization. So the most important thing to remember about this uh, natural protocol is that honest players vote uniquely every epoch. If you are honest, you vote for the first proposal you hear from the leader and only that block. You don't vote on anything else. Okay, so with this in mind, we can actually do a very simple consistency proof together. Okay, so this is the consistency proof. In this picture, imagine that uh, two-thirds and blue people voted for the blue block and the two-thirds and orange people voted for the orange block. We want to prove that, you know, if this is the case, it must be that the blue block is in fact the same as the orange block. And this would give us consistency. 
And our assumption is that the adversary controls fewer than one third of the players. Okay, so to see the proof, uh, let's think about the intersection of these two sets. And I, want, I want you to think, you know, how many players are in this intersection? Remember, there are in total only n players. Therefore, the intersection must have at least n over three players. Now remember that the adversary controls strictly fewer than n over three, right? So what does this mean? It means that there must be at least one honest player in this intersection. And now remember what I said about the honest player. An honest player would vote uniquely, right? So in other words, if this honest player in the intersection voted for both the blue block and the orange block, then there's only one explanation, and that is the blue block is in fact the same as the orange. And this is our simple consistency proof. So if you think about it a little longer, you'll realize that the consistency proof relies only on the fact that two thirds of the players are honest and the fact that honest players vote uniquely. It doesn't vote on, it doesn't rely on, let's say the leader being honest. But observe that we do need the leader for something, right? We need him for likeness. If the leader crashes or fails to make proposals, obviously we cannot make any progress. Alternatively, if the leader is malicious and let's say he proposes different blocks to different people, then everyone will vote on something different and nothing can gain enough votes. In this case, we also get stuck and we cannot make progress. But we do want the protocol to have decentralized security. And we don't want liveness to essentially rely on this like single central guy. And what we want is actually this picture instead where consistency and liveness both depend only on the two thirds of the players being honest. So how can we achieve this? How can we achieve liveness? So this is actually where all the classical protocols uh, got complicated. If you look at um, the classical approaches, like almost all these protocols follow a similar paradigm. Um, there is a simple normal path, which is voting based, uh, similar to what I had described. Um, but when you know, the liveness of the normal path fails, the classical protocols fall back to a very complicated recovery path, uh, sometimes called a view change to rotate the leader and fix the problem. Of course, I don't want to have to explain to you how the complicated recovery path works. Instead, I want to ask, so what is the dream approach here, right? Ideally, we want a protocol that achieves both consistency and liveness, but it should just be as simple and natural as the voting-based protocol we have seen. So can we have such a dream protocol? Okay, at this point, we turn our attention to Streamlit, which will give us a positive answer. So it says, yes, we can indeed have such a simple dream protocol. Okay, and then before I tell you the protocol, let me remind you again that the blocks are chained together using a hash chain. Uh, and we are also going to assume that every epoch is one second, right? It can be other parameters, but we're just going to assume one second for convenience. And jumping ahead a little, the protocol's consistency actually does not rely on any network timing assumption at all. Even when the network is badly partitioned, you know, uh, the players have long network delay, we always have consistency regardless. But I mean, obviously when the players are you know, partitioned and isolated and cannot talk to each other, uh, no one can promise progress. So th therefore Streamlit will only guarantee liveness when the honest players uh, can talk to each other and make a round trip within a second. So whenever network conditions are good, the protocol will make progress. So here, you know, one second is also the epic length. In our earlier protocol, you know, we had a single leader and if the leader is malicious, we are in trouble. In Streamlit, like the reason why we can avoid having a separate recovery path is because the protocol has an infield mechanism 
that allows the leader switch even every epoch. And switching leader is like so easy and essentially requires no extra effort. And therefore, for simplicity, we are just going to assume that we are indeed going to re-elect a new leader at random every epoch. And basically, we are going to take a random hash function h, and we hash the epoch number i, and this defines the leader of the epoch. So th there can be other leader election policies, but for simplicity, we will use this one um, for the purpose, purpose of this talk. And this is the entire streamlit protocol with an extra finalization rule in the next slide. Essentially, the protocol goes, you know, propose vote, propose vote, propose vote. Uh, in the most natural manner, there is nothing else. Okay, in every epoch, here's what happens. The leader of the epoch proposes the next block. Uh, so, you know, in the most natural way, the leader will take the longest notarized chain uh, it has seen so far, and then it extends it with the next block. It signs this block uh, as a proposal and sends the proposal uh, to everyone. Okay, so whenever I say a notarized chain, it means every block in this chain must have gained two thirds and votes. So now what do we do? Everyone votes. And everyone, everyone will vote for the first proposal received from the leader as long as the proposed block extends from one of the longest notarized chains observed so far. Right. So if the proposed block is extending from some very short chain, then you know, it might be that the proposer is malicious and he's trying to throw away a bunch of work in the middle. So in that case, I will refuse to vote. I will, I will basically check again that the proposed block extends from one of the longest notarized chains I've seen so far. And if that's indeed the case, I'm going to vote on the proposed block. And like before, when the block um, gains votes from two thirds of the players, it becomes notarized. Okay, so that's the whole protocol, except that we have uh, you know, additional finalization rule. So in our earlier protocol, you finalize the block when it becomes notarized. But now I'm going to tell you to be just a little bit more patient. In other words, notarized doesn't mean finalized in Streamlit. So what is finalized, right? When can, I, when can I confirm all the transactions, you know, in some prefix of the chain? So we are going to look for a good pattern. And what is a good pattern? If you observe in the notarized chain, there are three blocks appearing together with consecutive epoch numbers, then you can chop off the last of the three and the entire prefix is final. Uh, let's look at an example, actually, right? In this example, the numbers inside the blocks are epoch numbers. The epoch numbers need not be consecutive, right? In Streamly, they, they only have to uh, strictly increase. So we see that six, seven, eight are consecutive. And we have three consecutive, right? So in this case, we chop off the last one, which is eight. And the entire prefix, essentially up to the block seven, is final. So this finalization rule is kind of cute. It's actually a little bit magic. And this is you know, partly the reason why we can have such a simple protocol that's just propose vote, propose vote, propose vote, and nothing else, no separate recovery time. OK. So what the finalization rule uh, actually guarantees is that this picture cannot happen. Like in this example, we have six, seven, eight consecutive in a notarized chain, and we can prove that if this is the case, then the orange block, which is at the same height as the block seven, can never get notarized. So if you think about it a little bit longer, uh, you'll realize that this will give you a consistency. Okay, in fact, the consistency proof is also very simple, and we'll just do the consistency proof together. So, okay, as I promised, we'll do the consistency proof. The Leibniz proof is also pretty simple, but I won't have time to cover it in this talk. Okay, again, just to recall what we want to prove, right? In this example, we see six, seven, eight appearing together in a notarized chain. We want to prove that this orange block, which is at the same height 
at seven can never get notarized. In fact, no block, no other block can get notarized at the same height as seven. Okay, so first to do the proof, uh, let's first recall the lemma we proved in the first half of the talk. Uh, you know, remember in Streamlit, in every epoch, the honest players will vote uniquely. And therefore, we can conclude that in every epoch, at most one block can get notarized. Okay, so let's reflect what this means, right? So suppose for the sake of contradiction, the orange block actually got notarized. So now what can its epoch number be? Well, six, seven, eight are notarized blocks by our assumption. So obviously the orange block cannot have the epoch numbers six, seven, or eight. And therefore its epoch number has to be either greater than eight or smaller than six. Okay, so we can divide it into two cases. Case one, the orange block has an epoch number greater than eight. And we'll use nine as an example, because if it's greater than nine, the proof is the same. And the other case is when the orange block has an epoch number smaller than six, and we'll just use five as an example. And because if it's smaller than five, the proof is also essentially the same. And we just have to rule out these two cases one by one. But it turns out actually the two cases have symmetric proofs, and therefore we'll just do case one together. Okay, so here's case one. We want to rule this out. And how do we do that? Okay, first, by our assumption, block eight got notarized. And this means many people have voted for block eight in epoch eight. In fact, for the block eight to be notarized, it must have you know, two thirds n votes. This means strictly more than n over three honest players must have voted for it in epoch eight. So now I'm going to ask you, um, think about all these honest folks that voted for block 18 epoch eight, right? For them to agree to vote on the block, essentially the block must extend from one of the longest notarized chains they have seen at that time, right? That's our protocol rule, right? I'm only going to vote if it's, it extends from one of my longest notarized chains I've seen so far. So this means when all these honest folks voted for the block eight, they must have seen the seven notarized. So in other words, all these honest folks have seen the block seven notarized in epoch eight. So now I want you to think, will these honest people vote for the orange block nine in epoch nine? Remember, all these people have seen uh, seven notarized in epoch eight. Well, the answer is no, um, because as we said, by epoch nine, all these people have seen seven notarized, but nine doesn't extend from, you know, something that's at least as long as seven, right? So if they've seen seven notarized and nine is extending from the block six, then essentially nine doesn't extend from one of the longest notarized chains they have seen. And therefore, they'll just refuse to vote for the block nine in epoch nine. And because more than n over three honest folks refuse to vote for the orange block in epoch nine, the orange block cannot gain notarization because there aren't enough votes. So this allows us to rule out case one, and that, that's essentially the proof. Okay, so I mean, we've done case one. Uh, case, out, case two turns out to have a, a symmetric proof. So I'm just going to like skip over it. Um, so I, I just want you to you know, take my words that the proof is symmetric. And that's it for the consistency proof. So at this moment, I actually, I want to point out, um, if you stare at the consistency proof a little bit longer, you can easily realize that the consistency proof does not depend on any narrow timing assumptions. Even if the narrow conditions are bad, uh, let's say honest players become partitioned then their narrow delay becomes really long, it doesn't matter, we always have consistency. 
but of course, you know, if everyone's in their own isolated islands, cannot talk to each other, we can't promise progress. So essentially, we can only guarantee progress. We can only guarantee liveness when network conditions are good. And this is typically called a period of synchrony. During a period of synchrony, the honest players can speak with each other and make a round trip within a single second. Remember, that was like, you know, the epic length. So this theorem states that we have liveness when the narrow conditions are good. I won't go into details. So I've been actually pretty careful not to introduce too much technical jargon, but in fact, now it's a good time to say, in fact, Streamlit is a partially synchronous protocol, exactly because what I said, right? So what is a partially synchronous protocol? In a partially synchronous protocol, consistency is guaranteed no matter how badly the network conditions are, but liveness is guaranteed only during periods of synchrony. And a partially synchronous protocol is typically configured, configured with the parameter delta, which was our epoch length. This parameter is our best guess of the network delay under good conditions. Like it doesn't matter if your network occasionally violates this delta bound, consistency will never be broken. Uh, you just have to wait, you know, for the network conditions to heal to get liveness. So the classical protocols you may remember, like PBFT, Paxos, uh, they were all essentially in the same partially synchronous model. Uh, and uh, finally, I would like to mention that it is well known that in the partially synchronous setting, no protocol can tolerate one third or more corruptions. So essentially, Streamlit achieves um, optimal resilience, you know, just like the classical candidates, PBFT and Paxos. And this is also partly why I said Streamlit subsumes these classical candidates. Let me summarize. Uh, basically, Streamlit um, adopts a unified proposed vote paradigm, where right? proposed vote, proposed vote, proposed vote. There is no separate recovery path. The protocol allows leaders to switch every epoch, uh, and the leader switch mechanism is like woven seamlessly into uh, this uh, streamlined proposed vote paradigm. To conclude, I want you to read after me, proposed vote, proposed vote, proposed vote, boom, 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 confirm, confirm, confirm. Don't finalize upon notarization. Be a little more patient. Uh, when you see three consecutive epochs, appear together, chop up the last one, and finalize the prefix. Uh, of course, you may be able to write a better poem than mine. OK, in our paper, we also point out that Streamlit is not just a single protocol. It's a new paradigm. It allows you to construct a family of extremely uh, simple consensus protocols, like including under other assumptions, like you know, synchronous honest majority, crash fault setting, and so on. And Streamlit is also part of my new textbook, Foundations of Consensus and Blockchains, available at uh, distributedconsensus.net. Uh, and again, it's distributedconsensus.net, very simple to remember. Thank you very much. <laughs>